All right. Well, it's 12.02. We better get started. We've got a lot of information to go over today, so we don't want to waste any more time. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Nick Lewandowski. I'm the Government Relations Director here at Wisconsin Farmers Union. I want to thank you for joining us in our final installment of our winter, now spring, meeting series as we look closely at the challenges surrounding meat processing in Wisconsin and determining possible solutions to those challenges. And today we'll be talking about creative marketing approaches. Wisconsin Farmers Union is a member-driven organization and we're committed to enhancing the quality of life for family farmers, rural communities, and all people through educational opportunities, cooperative endeavors, and civic engagement. And meat processing was selected as a special order of business in both 2020 and 2021 by our members. Before we get started with today's panelists, uh, there are a few housekeeping items we need to cover. Uh, just a reminder that this event is being recorded. We'll share the recording on our, U on our uh, WFU YouTube channel so that it'll be easy for you to listen to it again and share with others. You'll get an email sent to you when that recording is uploaded. We're very excited to hear from you about the questions you may have. You can ask those questions by clicking on the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. Uh, again, if you move your mouse around, you'll find the Q&A button down there, and you can submit questions by clicking on that and typing them in. We know that meat processing is an issue affecting people across Wisconsin and, frankly, across the country, and we want to hear from you. We want to collect as many short stories as possible from farmers and processors so we can share the full impact. And you can do this by following the link that Kirsten is dropping into the chat now. At this time, I'll turn it over to our speakers. Each of them will have a chance to introduce themselves and then they'll spend about 10 minutes each uh, talking uh, about uh, their topic. Uh, we'll have each of them speak first and then we'll follow up with some questions afterwards. So uh, first off, I'm gonna turn it over to Leslie Sachina. Leslie. Great. Thank you, Nick. Uh, my name is Leslie Sachina, and I'm a farmer in Western Wisconsin, and I'll share a little bit more about my farm when I get into my portion of the presentation. And Scott Bluebaugh. Scott. Hi, I'm Scott Bluebaugh. I'm the president of Oklahoma Farmers Union, and I'm a farmer and rancher in north central Oklahoma. I grow cattle and wheat and soybeans and grain sorghum. Great. Thank you, Scott. And then finally, Vanessa Miller and Kyle Wisniewski. Um, so good evening, my name is Vanessa Miller. I am the sanitarium for the Oneida Nation here in Wisconsin. So good evening, I'm Kyle Wisniewski. I'm the Jinkwa supervisor of our indigenous community farm. Great, thank you all for being here today. We appreciate it. I'm gonna send it back over to Leslie and she'll start out. So I'm going to do is, um, I'm going to jump into sharing just a, I have a couple of slides just for some visual to go with my um, presentation, just because we have a short time period here. I just want to make sure that I'm supplementing what, what I'm sharing. So Nick, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, so um, I'll just give a quick overview about our farm and how we, and our market, and then I will then dive in more into some of the marketing strategies that I'm using on our farm. Um, and I will do my best to keep it 10 minutes because I could probably talk a lot longer on this topic, but if there's anything that you want me to elaborate on, um, I can sure do that um, when we get into the discussion and Q&A portion. So I'm in um, Western Wisconsin, about an hour east of Minneapolis, St. Paul, St. Croix County is where our farm is at. And I raise meat goats on pasture and we direct market everything um, that we raise on our, our farm um, for meat or we're retaining animals to continue to build our herd. And I will scroll down here to the next page. Um, so my our market and distribution, um, we everything I mentioned is direct marketed. And so it's split up into two areas, direct to cons consumer and then also um, local wholesale accounts. And I consider wholesale accounts direct um, because we are doing a lot of relationship building and uh, re or maintaining relationships and do uh, quite a bit of marketing efforts to continue that relationship there. Um, so our market is 
is pretty, um, for our direct to consumer market, um, it's kind of twofold. One, um, our biggest market is the local foods market. So folks who are really interested in how their food is grown, knowing their farmer, that relationship of local food. And then we also have uh, um, a, a customer base that is very diverse. When you look at cultural market, goat meat, if you're not familiar with it, really touches a lot of um, different cultural backgrounds and cuisines. And so um, even though it's it, it's very un each segment is very unique in itself and so we see a lot of crossover in both those segments for our customer base and we are doing delivery to our customers um, through a shipping program that we implemented this last year and then also on farm pickup and all of our orders are placed through a website and then our local wholesale accounts really are focused on local foods connection so our our buyers are with retail so some restaurants some other um, retail um, locations that are really interested in either grass-fed market or local foods and that I'm doing delivery. And so I'm really strategic in those partnerships because um, I want to make sure that they're a win-win for both our organizations, um, our farm, and also for them, but also um, wholesale is really a great avenue to move more product, but there's also, um, you know, be less margin opportunities. So I want to make sure it's a great, a good partnership. And so um, that is where, where we're at. And I didn't start in this our market, this is where we're at today. It took time to get to this and we've kind of inc incrementally um, have gotten to this point um, over time. And so I'm going to move into um, kind of the meat of my, of my, my, my presentation. And so um, I'm kind of talking a little bit about what we're doing and kind of my kind of big picture of how I'm focusing our marketing. And so the really the overarching um, approach to our direct marketing with our farm is really around the idea that today's marketing is really strongly rooted in, in um, digital marketing to really maintain and build on relationships with your customers or prospective customers. And this is really true even if you're selling, um, from my perspective, if you're selling in person, a hybrid model like we are, even um, in a wholesale capacity, you need to, you're not always going to be in front of your customer, but this is a way that you can have, continue to have other touch points and relationship building um, is through that digi um, digital communications or digital marketing. And so it really helps you be um, front of mind. And it also helps bring along prospective customers and that decision-making of um, potentially, or getting to the point of making that purchase um, and being in front of them, you know, getting to that point sooner. And so really the basics of this is really having an online presence and that starts with your website and email list. Um, your email list, um, we utilize an email platform, which I'd highly recommend. Um, and it'd be a system like um, MailChimp is a free system that you can start with, um, you know, versus having a um, kind of an email list you copy and paste in your um, email account, but then also having a social presence. And the level of what you use for these, you know, really can vary depending on if you're just starting out to if you're more focused on direct to consumer. And also like, you know, if you're more focused on wholesale or, or selling um, at, a, at a broader scale. Um, but our focus really, like I said, is um, really starts with our website and our email list. And our marketing approach has really been values-based marketing. And so think about like serving your customer. What can value can you bring to them um, versus a lot of, you know, we will do sales pitches, but most of it is that relationship building and, and value. And so how does that come through? It comes through recipes, helping our, teaching our customers how to cook our meat. I found that even if they grew up eating goat meat, they still don't know how to prepare it and not as confident. I don't want a customer buying meat for me and it's sitting in the freezer. I want them to enjoy it. So I really want to be inspiring and helping guide them along the way um, to utilize our food. Um, and, you know, I've seen also, you know, other areas related to adding value could be, you know, offering classes or more information on that background of the history of maybe a certain type of dish or with, you know, for goat meat, a lot of it is based in different cultures. So there can be a lot of different avenues you can take to help educate and add value um, to your customer with your, your, your protein per se. You know, this is goat meat, but obviously can be applied in other capacities. The, um, the, the other piece is, um, you know, with our, your website, um, you really want to be looking at how can you make it be easy for customers to buy from you? And we have an e-commerce platform. We didn't, we weren't always there, but there are ways to streamline that. Even when we we started working in collaboration with a butcher, but now we handle the whole the whole communication and distribution process to our customers just to make it easy. Um, 
and simplified and less confusing. So we know we can't be Amazon, but we can be maybe take some lessons from that. You know, a, a um, recent or a UW Extension research um, study on local foods I was reading more recently showed that more than 60% of people have stated in Wisconsin that it's, it can be time consuming to buy locally. So like, how can we make it easier for customers to want to do business with us? Um, and so I'm going to jump into um, social media. And this area has really taken a different shift, I'd say probably in the last couple of years. But I really, uh, the study, self-study I've done with social media marketing and digital marketing, the trend really now is it's about relationship building and less about selling. You want to continue to build on those relationships with your customers and they will they will come to you or you can want to drive them to go to your website, get on your email list. You can still do some selling, but you really want to be focused on that value adding and helping share your story about what you're doing on your farm. And I've really found that to be helpful for us to continue to build those, those relationships along the road um, through that digital space and social, I think. Um, and you know, you're not, um, that area is, is different than what it used to be maybe even five, seven years ago. And then um, I'll touch on community partnerships and co-branding. So there's, you know, other things that you can be taking a look at what you're doing outside of um, what you're doing specifically on your farm. So for example, one example of community partnerships with our wholesale partners, we are always looking for ways to promote what they're doing. So on social or even in our email list, our website, I'm I'm sharing where else our customer or, or customers or followers or community can access our goat meat. Um, you know, is the restaurant featuring our you know our product on the menu? What is that product? Is there a special when we're dropping off items? And they really appreciate that because they're getting more awareness, but it also um, has been a good win-win partnership because they're more apt to share what we're doing on our farm and then also um, have invited us to be in some other partnerships or have I've approached them on other partnerships um, and so it's just been a really good relationship all around and they really appreciated that um, in, in selling that because just because you know they're taking the product and selling it um, ultimately they're still buying it for me and I want to be able to um, continue to have that relationship with them. Um, some other examples of unique partnerships that we have done, we've worked with some vegetable CSAs in our area to do special offerings for purchase of our goat meat and pick up at that farm. Um, also, um, we've, I've started to look at, because we have invested in the e-commerce platform and shipping, how can I utilize that um, to sell more local product, not just ours? And I'm looking at maybe some options to do that um, in special offerings um, because as we all know, if we're involved in farming, it takes time. To, you can't just add extra inventory of your meat. It takes time to get there. And so, you know, I'm looking at maybe some special offerings of lamb or other meats that work well with our, our market that our audience might find of interest. Um, we've also done some um, looking at other complementary products. So we've worked in partnership with another goat farm to offer goat milk soap that's been branded under name. So those are some other examples. Looks like you're ready to cut me off, Nick. <laughs> yeah, I'll yes, just no. add... I'll add just a, a couple last items related to those collaborations. Um, you know, at a high level, there's other avenues to, um, you know, looking at food hubs where you can collaborate with other farmers in sales and marketing and distribution, you know, working together in that capacity, or even, I know there's some farmers in our area that are looking to market under kind of an umbrella brand as well, too. So there's a lot of things that you can do that, like, for as I, examples I've given um, with your farm, but also collaboration with other farmers in your area. So... Great. Nice. Thank you, Leslie. Yeah, yes, sorry no for the, the oh, dreaded no, that's okay. unmute. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I knew it was coming. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'll let you <laughs> All right. let our next guest go. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And, and we look forward to uh, some questions for you soon. I'm going to turn it over now to Scott Bluebaugh, uh, the president of Oklahoma Farmers Union. Scott? Oh, you need to unmute, Scott. Sorry. You go down in the left-hand corner. There you. There go. we go. There yep. we go. All right. Well, um, I want to talk to you all about uh, one of the projects that we've uh, been able to do here in Oklahoma this last year, uh, and really the pandemic helped us in this way uh, be able to get this project off the ground and running. Where I think we might have had a hard time otherwise, but uh, we we've got a law passed here in Oklahoma last session. Um, that says cattle that are born or bred 
born, raised, and processed in the state of Oklahoma can be labeled as certified Oklahoma beef. And then we have, uh, we got that put into law, the governor signed it. We actually got the governor to eat the very first steak on top of the uh, skyscraper, 50 story skyscraper here in Oklahoma City um, at a restaurant there, the only four star diamond restaurant in Oklahoma and uh, ate one of the steaks for the TV cameras and the, and the media and all. Um, so we've created a nonprofit organization called the Oklahoma Certified Beef Association. It is under our farmers union um, um, umbrella. Uh, we do have a second board of directors that are all ranchers uh, that, raise, that raise meat uh, that are members of this. So what we've been able to do is create a label um, that guarantees that these products, uh, this meat product has been bred, born, raised, and processed in the state of Oklahoma. And in, we have a third far, party verification system that we put in place using affidavits uh, that the processor, the local processor will sign off on. And then the rancher that raised the animals will also sign off on it. We're the record keeper of that and uh, do audits and that sort of thing to verify uh, and keep uh, you know some integrity to the program. But really this gives us, you know, we've been trying to have country of origin labeling uh, for at least 25 years. I know of, we've been in that battle and, and we'd win one and lose one and all. But really what we have done is create a state of the origin label here, which really serves the same purpose. It distinguishes our product from the other products in the in the supermarket shelf. So uh, we, we're able to have our ranchers produce uh, whatever their program is, whether they're a grass fed program or a traditional grain fed program. Uh, we even have some hybrid programs as well. So whatever our ranchers do well at the products that uh, they're producing. So long as it meets those four basic criteria, it could be certified as Oklahoma beef, Oklahoma certified beef, and marketed in the grocery stores, in the restaurants, direct to consumers at farmers markets, uh, and, and anywhere else. So uh, one of the things that we were worried about going on was the big packers hijacking uh, our brand, like they've done with so many other things. Um, and then using that for, for their benefit. But here in Oklahoma, we don't have any of the big four packers here in the beef business. Now they're here in the chicken business and the and pork, but not in the beef world. So all the processing plants we have in our state are very small mom and pop owned or their tribal uh, Indian tribes owned, uh, but, but very small operations, less than a hundred a week type of deal. So uh, this program really fits our state well. Uh, we've got a lot of excitement from consumers wanting to buy the product. Um, as we all know, you know what, what we're raising out here on the farm is, is usually way superior than what they can normally buy in the, in the big chain box stores uh, as far as quality and all. So we're, we're putting consumers, restaurant owners, independent grocers, um, together with our farmer and ranchers and being able to market this product. Uh, we created our own label. Uh, we patented it. It's the Oklahoma Certified Beef Association label. Uh, we're out marketing that as well, promoting it here at Farmer Genie. And so that's kind of what we're doing, trying to keep more of our retail food dollar in the farmer and rancher's pocket in that real community. And then also, um, we're creating more jobs with our small mom and pop processing plants out in the country because they're able to expand. We're seeing several new plants being built. Uh, a couple are already in operation here around the state. We have tremendous demand for small processing here. Um, and it's really a rebirth of that industry is happening here in the state. Uh, so this just is another tool that our independent farmers and ranchers can use uh, to market their products and distinguish our products from the big box stores. 
Great, thank you, Scott. And, and uh, we'll certainly have some questions for you here in just a little bit, but uh, looking forward to that. I think we have Vanessa and Kyle back now. Uh, do we have you? Yes, we do, yep. Okay, great. Go ahead. Okay, yep, thanks for having us, uh, Wisconsin Farmers Union. This is uh, Kyle Wisniewski, the Genhenkwa supervisor. Um, and I would just kind of like to talk to you about um, us moving forward um, in the last like three or four years. Um, once we've identified um, some processing problems um, here in a uh, 200 mile radius here in Northeast Wisconsin, we're near Green Bay. And um, we started noticing these problems about three years ago. And um, one, one of the main, um, one of the main things that we we're doing here at Jinhinkwa is providing food, uh, safe food um, for the community. Um, we've noticed um, a bunch of um, butcher shops and processing units um, closing um, just in the last three years. We uh, had approximately seven just in our radius in the last three years. Um, so we did, um, we are trying to um, combat that problem within our community. Um, as uh, the last gentleman uh, said that COVID um, had came through and it, it did kind of help uh, Jinhinkwa and the United Nation um, kind of see the, the gaps that we do have in our food system. Um, and we do pride ourselves on um, having a, a complete food system. That's something that we are uh, working towards. Um, we do have a, a certified uh, shorthorn uh, herd here at Jinhinkwa. We did move away um, just recently from the Galloway breed. Uh, we were having a hard time um, getting those animals up to a, a market weight um, within our system. Uh, I know that can be done um, in other systems, but we do grow um, other uh, indigenous crops um, in the pastures um, and in the cornfields um, with the cattle. So we do have a, a little bit of a unique um, operation action in and um, we just couldn't quite get those Galloway up to um, an acceptable weight. Uh, so we did move uh, to a short horn and we are um, at the time, the only um, tribe in the nation with a registered short horn herd. And that's very important uh, to our community. So they know um, directly where that food is coming from. And we take a lot of pride in that. Um, we are a program um, of the United Nation. So, we weren't necessarily looked at um, to make money, but provide knowledge, transferable knowledge, and um, basically give our community the tools uh, to feed themselves. Um, that all changed um, within the last two or three years. They asked us to put a business plan together. Um, and we made a plan um, basically um, relying on cattle uh, to bring us um, to sust uh, sustainability. And um, we hope to be up to about 75 animals by 2023. Um, and the plan looked great. And as we all know, and uh, something that we're all trying to, um, to fix is processing. So um, we got, um, it was a rude awakening for us. You know, we, we, uh, we had about 19 animals that are ready to go yearly um, and we can only process two. Um, and there's nobody in the area um, that we can find within a, a two year, um, a weight, you know, to get more cattle in. So that's a big problem for us when we're trying to feed our people, um, or approximately 16,000 people. So we are in the process now of getting a, a mobile um, harvesting unit um, that will be here at the end of April. And we do anticipate um, sharing that unit with the, the outside community. We know that it's a huge need and that we're all in this together and that um, working together is gonna to be the best outcome for all of us. So um, a lot of our services and the program, Jinhinko program is also for outside um, tribal members as well. So that unit will be available and we're running into more problems with that. You know, where do we find a butcher? So um, it just kind of compiles and um, we're just hitting it head on and um, we're really making a lot of strides. So we're excited with that, with that uh, harvesting unit coming here at the, uh, the end of April. And we are, um, we did go away from a, a certified organic and we we're, we're moving towards a um, indigenous certification that we are um, creating. We hope to um, go to other um, tribal territories, our reservations and also certify them. Um, I've been to other uh, ranches around um, the United States and um, a lot of the, the organic certifications or the 
USD, uh, lingo or things don't work for us. And um, it's important for us to identify those problems and then um, knowing that we do have the right as a, a sovereign to take care of ourselves. So with that indigenous certification, it's really gonna help our tribes um, regulate you know, ourselves to our ceremonies. If we have different ceremonies that we wanna do, um, organic certification and USD won't allow that. So um, those are just a couple of things. Um, marketing, we do, um, at the moment we are working with the Oneida market. Um, they do take um, one animal and, and then since COVID hit, um, you know, we've lost uh, many jobs here at Oneida and the market also took a hit. So in the meantime, we are providing uh, two animals a month to the Oneida Emergency Food Pantry to uh, directly combat the food security issues on the Oneida Reservation. So um, our higher leadership and our government has uh, directed us to do that. And um, that's where all of our beef is going at the moment to uh, directly feed um, our community. That is open to outside members as well. So um, community members and tribal members can um, use that um, pantry. So we do have safe um, grass-fed beef going to the pantry to our people um, through that avenue. Um, we do, um, we are looking as well. Um, we have some interest from an area butcher um, about, um, about having a, a standalone processing plant here at Oneida. Uh, we're in the beginning stages, but once again, you know, we're all in the, we're all in the same page and we're all on, um, facing the same challenges. So um, we're looking to feed our people, but also help, you know, the surrounding area. Um, Oneida always wants to be a good neighbor. And that's, um, you know, that everybody deserves uh, good, safe food. And then lastly, I know it's a little bit off subject, but we, we also have problems with processing uh, chicken and poultry. So I was contacted by an area college and they, um, an area college and a uh, co-op, and they would wanna work with Jinhinko. We have our own um, central processing unit is what we call it, where we do turkeys and chickens and the community's deer and stuff like that. So they approached us. Um, they thought they could maybe use some COVID funds to update our facility. Um, so we could handle more than 999 birds and then um, probably get state certified and USDA certified. So we are in the beginning talks with that as well to try to help out the surrounding community. So it is a big thing that we really try to drive home is that we are, we are our own sovereign nation and we are trying to feed our people, but we really want to be a good neighbor and that everybody deserves um, safe food. And, um, and that's where Vanessa comes in is, um, is to regulate safe food on the reservation. And she does a really good job with that. And I'll turn it over to her now. Um, thanks, Kyle. That's that's a lot of awesome information here that we're trying to pile in all the good, great stuff we're doing here in a few minutes. So I know we're kind of running on a little bit of a short time frame here. So I am very long winded person. So I will try to keep a, a check on the clock here as well. So as Kyle kind of said, um, I am the nation sanitarian. So um, being a sovereign nation, we self-regulate ourselves when it comes to food service and safe food. So we do have our own food service codes and codes and laws that our environmental health division has been cited as being the regulatory agency. So as Kyle had mentioned here, um, we've really been looking hard and pushing and promoting and seeing if it would be possible and worth our while to have our own meat processing, processing facility here that we operate and run and um, hopefully are able to self-regulate as well. Um, one thing is A, just like he said, first, we wanna have food security. You wanna be able to feed your people. If you can't feed your people, then are you truly sovereign? Um, no, right? Beyond that though, also being good neighbors, there's a need, there is a local need for meat processing facilities. So um, I don't wanna say marketing wise, but marketing that value of, um, having local good healthy raised animals here that have also been processed locally um, with our own indigenous certifications um, marketing that and showing that things are 
in-house, done locally, done the right way, and not only the right way, but a lot of times our standards here in-house, we self-impose and self-create as being higher, higher than USDA and local standards. Um, so for instance, um, with food handler certifications, um, FDA requires, you know, somebody on site at a food service industry to have it every five years. We require them to be certified every single year. So it's just little things like that that we have implemented on ourselves and we enforce on ourselves to be higher standards. So marketing those processes and that loop that is all an in-house closed circle loop is something that we are really excited to be able to do, to be able to put grass-fed beef on the shelves at our market um, to our local community and the public and say, hey, this is beef that's been raised here um, with very high locally indigenous completely grown standards and farmer knowledge and processed here with the safer that I guess knowledge that first for them to hear did a really good job of explaining that of our consumers the number we're not just collecting you know dollar amounts from them they're not just the tag number or a vendor number but we really want to make sure that they understand that they have access to us for questions for knowledge um, for well, what can we do to meet your needs? What are your inputs that maybe things we need to change that we could be better? So it really is building that um, personal relationship with our with our community and our people and our our overlapping community as well, including non-indigenous people. So um, Kyle, I don't know if you have anything else to share here, but I know we kind of covered a lot really quick. I don't. Um, other than you know we have other programs at the nation um, with um, other poultry we have eggs and stuff like that so we do market eggs and um, we do process we do have community processing in our CPU for um, turkey and chicken um, for ceremonial use and for uh, food use so um, we are we are up and running and we hope to get bigger and um, to really be able to help out the, the surrounding area Thank you very much, both of you, Kyle and Vanessa. Thanks for that information. And uh, we are just a little bit ahead of schedule, actually, which is uh, surprising, uh, but good. So let's go ahead and jump into our q and i uh, I'm going to start with Leslie, since Leslie was our first presenter. Um, Leslie, what's the most time-intensive uh, part of this process for you when it comes to marketing? And do you see collaborative marketing approaches helping with that? I'd say the, the most time intensive is, is getting into a, um, figuring out a, a schedule, kind of figuring out a plan and kind of make your, make the process um, kind of a, it, a process that has its own schedule and timing on it. So it's not feeling like it's um, one more thing to do. Um, I, I'm involved in, I manage the farm and do the marketing, which means, you know, there's, Kind of two silos of, of projects going on and I think having a planned initiative for marketing really um, it can be time consuming but I think it's well worth it because then in the, when you're in the thick of doing things it can really um, make your life easier. Um, the collaboration side I, I believe um, if there's ways that you can um, I think what Collab collaborating with other farmers in locally um, and our other partners, like I talked a little bit about before too, I think if there's ways that you can um, share what others in your community are doing or, or look for ways that you can continue to partner and also recognize those partnerships, I think also play pays a lot of dividends in, in um, helping continue to grow um, your, our work, um, you know, we're talking about marketing here, but help, you know, grow your marketing efforts, but also help continue to grow and in, 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 um, helping us, all of us continue to serve our community um, with the food that we're, we're producing. So I think those partnerships, like I talked about, can be really useful that way and not necessarily always like reinventing the wheel, like kind of leaning on each other. Great. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, let's move over to Scott. Uh, Scott, what were the challenges, if any, in getting this legislation passed? And did you have to form any coalitions 
uh, with other ag or livestock groups to, to make that happen? Well, I'll tell you, we didn't have much help, uh, as you might can imagine at the state level, but um, I think our timing with the virus helped us out a lot. So we actually got this passed uh, with a unanimous vote in the Senate, unanimous vote in the House of Representatives, and then the governor signed it into law. So there wasn't uh, a lot of help from the other farm groups, but they they kind of stayed out of our way uh, and let us do it. It was like, well, that, it's not gonna do them any harm. So they, they, they kind of allowed us to, to move forward and, and get this done. But, um, and one of our advantages I will say is that we, you know, we don't have those big four uh, processors here in our state and, and our tribal governments are pretty powerful here politically. Um, and they're uh, much like uh, one of our other guests there was talking about uh, many of the tribes here have built new processing plants in the state to serve their own needs. And then th those of their neighbor neighboring areas as well. And we're grateful for the partnerships that we have here in the great relationships with our tribal governments. Thank you, Scott. And I know we've got a couple others here, but I think we'll go over to Kyle and Vanessa real quick and, and, and get them and probably loop back to you if that's okay. Uh, Kyle and Vanessa, could you tell us a little more about your food box program that you have there? Okay, yeah, so we, we have a food box uh, program. We had a, a community garden um, that, got, um, that got hit by COVID. So we obviously didn't have people coming to the garden. Um, approximately 50 or 60 individuals yearly um, are part of the community garden. So we did not have them there um, until I was able to uh, pass a, a, um, a health plan um, through our health department and Vanessa. So, um, what we did is we still had the garden growing. So we just invited um, community members, the surrounding community and our um, membership um, to go through a drive-through. So they, um, they pick up fresh um, indigenously grown produce. And we've also thrown uh, some of our eggs in there. Um, and they've, we did that um, throughout the summer. Uh, we also, and I'm not sure if you're, if that person is talking about, um, we also have a, a large food box giveaway through our emergency food pantry as well, um, through a USDA grant. Um, and that's something a little bit different. Um, but the one at Jinhinkwa is all indigenously grown foods, poultry or meat. Um, and that is a summertime uh, giveaway, usually from the end of June until uh, the end of September. And it is free. Great, thank you, Kyle. Uh, and this one I think will pose for, uh, for Vanessa. Uh, you mentioned uh, a couple times uh, in your presentation the importance of food security for your community. Uh, can you tell us a little more, bit more about how you see the farm uh, in that uh, and the role that the farm plays in that food system? Sure. Well, um, so obviously with COVID time hitting is one thing that we are quote unquote grateful for is it exposing the gaps in everybody's system, not just ours. Um, I think it has shown us and has got, gotten our political leadership and the community behind our food sovereignty efforts and that it really is important that um, before we are able to really do anything else, we have to be able to feed ourselves. So food security is the first step really in food sovereignty is meeting those immediate nutritional needs. So our farm is such a big role player in that because um, our big farm engine Hinkwa um, is our sole sources of our protein here that we're able to provide our people. Um, so whether that is our beef or our buffalo, um, Jehinkwa also has our eggs and our chickens. And that is something that they have done such an incredible job of making sure of, um, okay, not just that, because that's something we pride ourselves here is being fed shouldn't be the goal. That is step one. Everybody deserves high quality food. So just because we're in times of COVID where 
Um, we are donating items to our emergency um, food pantry for food boxes, or we're doing drive through um, farm on site. Doesn't mean any of our standards change. It's still high, highest standards we can hold ourselves to, and that is some thing that um, we will continue to do because of what's what we've been instructed to do culturally in accordance with our original ways. Relationship with our land and our natural. Um, we aren't the only one to really take this um, response people with the resources that the creator's given us. So by being able to secure um, people's immediate nutritional needs, and, and it's not even just physical nutritional needs. We have such a, a circular view here with food that it doesn't, our foods aren't just meeting our nutritional needs, but by providing these boxes to our people, it's also connecting us back to our lands and our ways. So it's not even just food security, it's health security and um, emotional security right now for our community, which is, I think as COVID really, really exposed is, is a big need. So um, we're grateful for COVID in a way because it's really exposed some gaps that we need to work on, but it's also given a push for our community to say, okay, our food system is um, something that we really need to make sure it's strong and tight and that everybody here is Great, thank you, Vanessa. Um, let's go back over to Scott for one more quick question. I know we've got a couple for you, Scott, and I think we'll probably sure. need to follow up via email if that's okay. But uh, here's one. Uh, you mentioned that there, you're seeing some new small processors opening up down in Oklahoma. Are there economic support opportunities that are helping those businesses get started? A little bit. Uh, so the tribal governments uh, down here are pretty flush with money. I'll just, you know, they have gambling uh, enterprises and they do very well with their businesses. Uh, and, and, and so they're well financed. And so they're able to open really some state of the art plants. Uh, some of the nicest plants I've ever walked into are tribal owned. Uh, and then the other part was our governor did use $10 million of the CARES money uh, and, and allocated that in grants back to the small processors. So while we've had several uh, brand new plants being built by individuals, um, we've also had a lot of our older custom exempt uh, processing plants, mom and pops uh, receive grant money and they were able to upgrade their facilities uh, in both be, to be USDA uh, inspected and also to be uh, when they did that, they were able to, in most cases, double their capacity as well, uh, just through uh, improvements. You know, many of these plants are 40 or 50 years old uh, and being able, half a million dollars goes a long way in upgrading these very small plants in the real community. So that is basically it as far as economic uh, help from the, from the government. Uh, but we, there is such demand here uh, to get the, the cattle processed. In many cases, there is a year to 18 months waiting list uh, in order to get these animals processed. So, um, you know, there's, uh, everyone recognizes the economics to it. And uh, so we're getting some plants built uh, with just entrepreneur mom and pop money. Well, that's great to hear. Uh, that's that's a wonderful thing. We're we're glad to hear that, and hopefully we can see more of that happening across the country. Uh, thank you all. We we do have other questions. I know that we can't get to in the time we have, but we'll certainly follow up with uh, all of you and uh, get those to you, and then we'll get those answers out. So I'm going to quickly uh, jump into some opportunities uh, here on the state uh, level for marketing uh, through DATCAP. Uh, there's a couple uh, different options available to uh, folks here in Wisconsin. Uh, there's the Buy Local, Buy Wisconsin program uh, through DATCAP, which was launched back in 2008. It's a competitive grant program that's designed 
to strengthen Wisconsin's ag and food industries by working to reduce the marketing, distribution, and processing hurdles that impede the expansion of sales of Wisconsin's food products to local purchasers. Uh, and unfortunately, the 2021 grant applications uh, ended already, uh, but uh, that was back uh, in late March. Uh, but certainly uh, be aware of that. Uh, we've got a website that we can drop into the chat. I think maybe Kirsten has access to that. Uh, uh, if not, uh, let me know and I can get that. Uh, but that's one opportunity. Uh, there's also the Something Special from Wisconsin uh, program. It's a trademarked marketing program and it's administered by DATCAP as well. Um, and uh, this started back in 1983 and, and many folks will recognize that uh, that logo, that sticker um, that you'll see uh, on products in the grocery store and, in, and all over the state, frankly, uh, but it helps its members stand out above the rest. It's a quick and reliable way to identify genuine Wisconsin products and services at grocery stores, retail outlets, farmers markets, and restaurants throughout the state. Uh, and any business, no matter how big or small, can participate. You, can, you apply for approval, uh, to use the logo if at least 50% of the value of your product or service is attributable to Wisconsin ingredients, uh, production, or processing activities. So I think Kirsten's dropped in a link to that. A um, couple things on the legislative level, uh, both on the state and federal uh, level. We've got uh, a great opportunity to get some uh, meat processing and meat industry uh, influence uh, in the governor's budget and in the, into the state budget, frankly. Uh, the governor included uh, a number of uh, provisions in his budget uh, to develop small meat processing infrastructure, uh, one of which provides uh, grants to new meat processors and existing small plants to fund facility upgrades, uh, cutting equipment and cold storage to increase processing capacity. It also uh, includes upgrades for inspection levels and helps to meet the needs of small and medium livestock producers. There's also a provision uh, that would fund additional state meat inspectors as needed to accommodate the growth in processing infrastructure. And then finally, uh, it would direct federal COVID-19 relief funds to expanding meat processing infrastructure. We're at about the third of the way through the state budget process right now. This month uh, starts the Joint Finance Committee hearings across the state and then the virtual hearing at the end of the month. This is where we need you as uh, Wisconsinites and as, as uh, WFU members to really voice uh, your support for the governor's budget uh, and especially these meat processing uh, provisions. So if you have any questions on that, if you need some assistance, if you wanna write a letter to the editor, if you wanna testify, uh, we're only asking folks to testify at the virtual hearing right now due to the pandemic. But if you would like assistance on that, uh, and if you want more information, you can go to our budget website, wisconsinfarmersunion.com slash budget. Thank you, Kirsten, for dropping that in. Um, some other things uh, on the state level. Um, I mentioned the governor's budget, what it includes. We've also been in, in contact with uh, Representative Dave Considine, uh, who's interested in introducing legislation that would match what's in the governor's budget. Um, the reason for that is we've heard that um, new programs uh, in the budget will likely not get funded. They're only really going to be focusing on existing programs, uh, which is what tends to be the case. Although we've seen a lot of good movement, uh, last week there was a hearing on the Senate Ag Committee on meat processing, so that gives us hope that at least some of what's in the governor's budget may be included, maybe not all of it. So we've been working closely with Representative Considine and his office uh, to uh, work on that legislation in the case that uh, the governor's proposals get kicked out of the budget. So we'll keep you informed on that as well. Um, but we have some uh, friends over in Montana through Farmers Union as well. Uh, they've run some bills. Um, unfortunately, those got tabled in committee, but those are placard bills, not necessarily labeling bills. Um, and what it would do, it would, uh, it would require that a placard be placed in the vicinity of grouped displays of beef, pork, or both. Uh, and there'd be two options uh, for the placard when it comes to beef and pork. And, and it would include born, raised, and processed in the USA, or imported or origin unlabeled. Uh, and it would not include any retailer penalties. Now, like I said, unfortunately, it got tabled as well as the other bill. 
Uh, we've got more information on that uh, as well. We can share, uh, Kirsten's dropping that into the chat, but uh, we have options available to us, I think, in the future. I think the, the option that uh, Scott mentioned in Oklahoma, I think some of what's been done in Montana, I know there's some movement on a bill in Nebraska as well when it comes to um, uh, owning shares of an animal, uh, which is similar to what Wyoming has as well with their uh, Food Freedom Act. I think there's a lot of things that we can look at in the future uh, as possible uh, pieces of legislation uh, for us to move forward. But uh, moving on to the federal level, I just wanted to share some good news. Uh, the late December omnibus package that passed uh, included a revised version of the Ramp Up Act. Uh, that was introduced back in July, uh, strongly supported by Farmers Union. It was one of our fly-in asks back in September. Uh, and what it does is it provides $60 million, $60 million to help small-scale meat and poultry processing facilities uh, engage in interstate shipment of meat products. Uh, grants will be made available to these establishments to make the necessary improvements uh, to be federally inspected. Uh, and this investment will help provide more marketing choices for farmers and ranchers, which should prove to be helpful in today's consolidated marketplace. Further, it also includes the language uh, to establish a livestock dealer trust, which has been a long time farmers union priority uh, and that will help farmers and ranchers receive payment if a dealer, a livestock dealer happens to go out of business. One other provision that passed in the most recent um, uh, stimulus plan, the American Rescue Plan was $100 million uh, will be used to help small and very small meat packing facilities pay for the cost of overtime fees for federal meat inspectors. It stems from another bill that we've been supportive of. Uh, it was part of our fly-in asks. Uh, so it's nice to see some of these federal level uh, pieces of legislation getting passed. Um, we can expect more legislation like this to be introduced in, on the federal and, and possibly even the state level over the coming weeks and months. And we'll certainly keep you uh, informed on all of that when those uh, are introduced and, and how we're engaging on them. So um, we're winding things down here. Uh, I don't know if there are any final questions or, or anything like that, but uh, otherwise we'll just kind of wrap things up uh, if that works for everyone, I just need to jump back to my different screen here. Uh, again, we want to thank everybody for taking time out of your day uh, to, to be with us, especially over your noon hour. We hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, we've certainly enjoyed uh, doing this uh, over the winter months, but we know that spring is here now and it's time to get busy and get out in the field and, and get back to work so that we can uh, do what we love to do as farmers and ranchers. Uh, if you like what you've heard today and you're not already a member, we hope that you'll join the Wisconsin Farmers Union. We can make greater change when people come together. And so we would invite you to join today at the link in the chat. Kirsten's going to drop that in. If you don't live in Wisconsin, we can gladly connect you with a Farmers Union chapter in your state. Maybe we'll be sending people your way, Scott. Uh, thanks, ag thanks again to our panelists. Uh, we want to thank you for taking time out of your day as well. Uh, and to everybody who joined us, our friends over at Minnesota Farmers Union are actually going to continue this conversation. Uh, they're planning on doing some uh, continued webinars and, and uh, a series of meetings as well over the coming months. They don't have everything up on their website yet, but I spoke with uh, Stu over there at Minnesota. He said uh, to be sure and, and check their website, mfu.org, uh, for more information on that uh, that'll be posted soon. And uh, finally, uh, Wisconsin Farmers Union members are eligible for scholarships uh, for the Artisanal Modern Meat Butchery Program at Madison Technical College. Uh, we've got some funds available for that. If you uh, are interested in that, please contact uh, our administrative assistant at Wisconsin Farmers Union, Jessica Reba, and she can get you uh, all of the information for that. So. Uh, looks like we've got a little bit of time left, but I don't know that anyone would argue if we ended things a little bit early. So I'll uh, just again, thank everyone uh, for coming out today and joining us. And uh, we thank you for supporting us through these winter meetings uh, that we've held over the last few months. <laughs>